it's it's great. It's great to be back at an OJUG, and it's great to see everybody in person and uh, so many familiar faces. There's, I think it's good for the soul to to be able to meet in person. Um, I'm excited. Um, yeah, so this is a talk that's based on something I did at uh, Bar Camp Omaha about a month ago, um, and it was a pretty quick 25-minute talk. Um, and so I kind of extended that with the idea that, um, yeah, as somebody who was the OJUG president for five or six years, you know, I've, I've really gone all in on Elixir and, and Phoenix. And so I tried to kind of adapt this talk to kind of provide some context. So there's not going to be, this isn't going to be an Elixir tutorial. It won't be a Phoenix tutorial to give you a feel for how uh, some of this is different. But it's, it's really, um, the goal is to kind of convey why live view is different than almost everything else. And then also, how did I get here um, as somebody who's been using, was using Java when the collection classes were not on library um, in 1998. So, um, so that's kind of the, the, the context for this talk. So I haven't given this whole thing before, um, and I'm going to try to get through it in, a, in an hour or so. I've got a lot. I, could, I feel like I could talk for four hours on this, um, and I promise I won't. So um, yeah, so um, my bio page, I made it a little bit longer because I think it's relevant. And I, I think you'll see as you get into this, um, this has really been almost a lifetime journey getting to the point that I'm at right now. Um, I've been coding, getting paid to code for 35 years. Um, a lot of what I've done have been large system rewrites or conversions. Um, and those projects are like different than startups. They're also different than enhancements to existing systems. So that's really, I mean, it's absolutely colored my view of things. And I think it's good to know that as I'm talking about this stuff and what I get excited about, that's part of, you know, it's, it, this is really a journey kind of, a, it's, it's my journey. And so what I've been through is going to color what I'm saying. Um, but I, these were big projects, and they're hard to do. And, um, and so definitely color, color is what I've seen. And part of what I bring that up is um, I've been a part of a lot of projects that had anywhere from like three to seven attempts to get done. And it's because these really large, like mission critical type systems, they're hard to do. It's hard to do the rewrites. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. It's really nice when they go right. And I've reflected on that a lot over my career about, you know, what's different? Like, why do some of these go well and some don't? Um, I started out in C and C++, uh, Java, Groovy, JavaScript. Um, I've actually been able to do a little bit of paid Elixir, which is nice. Very early in my career, I did some 4GL stuff, and I'm going to talk more about what that is. Um, I found out a lot of people don't know what that is. Um, I've also kind of done the traditional JSP servlet, struts, spring, micronaut. Vue.js um, coding. I have done, dabbled in Scheme, Lisp, Haskell, Clojure, none of that work was paid. Um, and then uh, that's relevant to, I think, why I was ready for Elixir. Um, so I've really done a mix of kind of full stack efforts um, and large multi-year, multi-million dollar projects. And then um, I was a principal enterprise architect um, until May, and then I took a position with uh, Dev Obsessed, which is a new company, um, and I'm going to focus on trying to build an Elixir practice. So I kind of had a great experience with Elixir this spring and decided to go all in on it. It was that exciting for me. Um, and uh, thanks. I appreciate Dev Obsessed basically helping me, uh, let, paying me to help put this together. Um, and it's just a con contracting company, consulting company trying to attack uh, top talent, doing the typical back-end, front-end, web, Kafka, all kind of the, the, the usual players. Um, so I appreciate being able to do that with their support. Um, so uh, talking about this, what's interesting is, you know, a lot of companies get to this point where um, critical systems become very expensive to maintain. And, and management gets frustrated, like the runtime costs, like you keep throwing hardware at existing software. And, um, and enhancements that probably took days when the systems were built start to take weeks. Now they get months. Um, when I was working at um, Object Partners, I worked on a project where um, the backlog was like 
two years growing towards three years. I mean, they, like, so it was, it was like the company was pedaling backwards. They could just never get ahead of the backlog. The, the legacy systems were too complicated. They were too hard to maintain. Um, and, you know, when companies hit that point, I think that's when they say, okay, we just have to do a rewrite, you know, where we're, you know, and it's usually the business driving it. Like they've hit a point where they realize, I'm never gonna get the thing that I asked for three or four years ago, um, and we need to do something. But like I said, those things are hard to bring home. Um, and also I think, um, you know, my perspective on this is when we do these projects, I think they should have a shelf life of longer than three years. And, and some people will chuckle, but I've been at a lot of conferences where people will be like, I mean, I remember one in particular, a spring conference of all things, where somebody said, really, your software like stays in production like longer than three years? We're just assuming we're gonna rewrite it all. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, you know, as, as engineers, like that hit me, that hit me hard. Cause it's like, really, like we as a, as a you know, profession, we can't do better than that. Um, that's a lot of money and a lot of effort. Like I feel like somehow we, we should be able to do better. <laughs> um, and, but these things are hard and we've known about this since 1975. You know, if you've read The Mythical Man Month and interestingly the 25th anniversary of the book and the 40th anniversary of the book, you know, are like still bestsellers. Um, we do a great job at not learning um, lessons for being really smart people otherwise. Um, so what caught my attention about four years ago, I went to an ElixirConf in 2018, uh, was as I'm trying to stay informed and I'm, you know, you read blogs, you look at InfoQ or whatever, and you see things like Discord um, supporting 100 million users, um, 12 million concurrent users, and the team's five engineers big. Like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, or Pinterest, they rewrote a notification system where they dropped the code base to a tenth of what it used to be and cut their servers in half. As an engineer, right, as an architect, as a team lead, as a technologist, like at some point you can't ignore that. You see that once, maybe, you go whatever, you look at it twice, it gets your attention. There's more companies, you know, where they're running 20 times faster. You've got some companies that are talking about, yeah, we converted from our old system to Elixir and Phoenix. And one of our experiences was it was easy to learn. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's a functional programming language. Most people don't say, oh, functional programming language and easy to learn in the same sentence. Um, and Bleacher Report, they're, you know, like one of the largest sports websites. You know, they tried Node, they tried Go before they went to Elixir. Um, easy to learn, handle an eighth of the traffic. Um, the one that got me was they dropped their cloud footprint from 150 servers to five when they went from Ruby on Rails to Elixir. Like, you just can't ignore that, right? I mean, we're all probably living with companies that are having their, you know, you hope only a seven-digit Amazon bill. Um, so you look at things like that, that's like real money um, at that point. Uh, <clears throat> and there's like, yeah, one of the world's largest betting sites. Um, I was looking at, like, what did they learn? Like, this always gets my attention. They felt like when they got done going from Java to Erlang, uh, not even Elixir, it was a big reduction in code complexity. Again, this idea of this, and this still kind of boggles my mind, like you're gonna go from a single node uh, of tens of thousands of users to hundreds of thousands of users on one server. Um, however, I shouldn't have been surprised when I read that because 10, 12 years ago, and I cannot remember the speaker's name, but we had somebody at the OJUG down at Gallup who did a lightning talk and he fired up Apache or Tomcat, I think, and got about 10,000 concurrent sessions running on the laptop before it crashed. And he got the, he did an Erlang program and he had it to like 100,000 and it just kept running. It wouldn't, like he couldn't really get it to crash. Um, and so it's kind of, this isn't, so actually I'm not the first person to talk about Erlang at an OJUG. Um, but these, these, yeah, WhatsApp, tw two million concurrent connections on one machine, like we're not doing that in Java. Like it's just not gonna happen, right? So these numbers, you know, they just, so why Elixir for me as a longtime Java person? You can't read that stuff and at least not take a closer look. I mean, it's just too compelling. Um, and, um, 
And it's a combination of like the performance stuff, and then like it's not just that, but it's how developers talk about it. Like they wax rhapsodic about this. In the same way that I remember t people talking about TDD 15 to 20 years ago, they'd say, oh my gosh, yeah, we implemented TDD with an old uh, cruise control server way before Jenkins, and it changed how we build software. Like we don't, we went in, we went live and nobody was working overtime and, um, and I wasn't afraid to change my code anymore. I mean, it, it, it changed my life, you know? You hear people talking that way, and then you start reading about companies like Toyota and PepsiCo using it, and it's like, okay, so this is not just for startups either. This is, something's happening in this ecosystem. It's getting traction, it's worth a closer look. Um, and what I saw as somebody who's been very experienced with Groovy on the JVM, as well as Java, and I've dabbled with some of the functional programming languages that what's different about Elixir is it's practical, not just academic. So you've got things like Scala, and Haskell that were born in the universities. Um, and Elixir's coming from a different place. You know, Erlang is what Ra uh, RabbitMQ was written in. It, it was built to run phone systems. It was meant to, um, to be used, not just to, uh, as an academic exercise. And Elixir brings that sense of practicality. Like, it was designed to build stuff, not just to be an academic experiment. And it's nice because then it doesn't have some of that baggage that I feel like I've seen with languages like Scala. It also doesn't have any JVM baggage. So Clojure is kind of like a love-hate relationship for me and some other people. There's, there's parts of it that I really like, but it still has the baggage of, of, what, of the JVM, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and of course, I had to take a closer look because the Erlang if you read anything about it, their VM runtime stability is kind of like legendary, almost mythical. Like, these systems run forever and don't crash. Um, in a way, people talk about it in a way that you just don't talk about um, other systems. So I'm gonna, I just want to define some terms before we get into the meat of this. Um, so you know, Elixir is a functional programming language. It runs on Erlang. It's about 10 years old. Uh, like I said, it was designed to be accessible and concise. So the people that invented it came from Ruby on Rails, and I think that's really significant. Um, that community has a passion for productivity that um, you know I don't see in the typical uh, kind of our, our typical corporate stacks that we built the software with today. Um, when I went to the first Elixir Conf in 2018, probably there were 600 people there. 90% of them were Ruby on Rails developers saying, we built this app, it runs great, but it's kind of out of control, and we, need, we want to rewrite it into something faster and better. Um, and so they bring that, that expectation of, like, we should just be able to go fast. We shouldn't be taking years to do stuff. We should be able to do stuff in months. Um, and, of course, and Erlang has been around since the late 80s, um, has that legendary um, reputation for uptime. So I'm going to talk about functional programming. Um, I'm not, I, this, I can't do a tutorial in functional programming, but you know, three of the highlights are higher order functions. So functions that can take functions as input and return functions as output. You have this idea of pure functions, which is code that given the uh, input will always return the same output and it's not reaching outside of the scope of the function. So think about things like, um, a loop that's not going to make API calls, a loop that's not going to reach into the database. Um, and it's also not going to mutate anything. So you're going to pass something in, you're going to get something back out, but the thing that you passed in is not going to change. You're guaranteed that. Um, or if you're going to code in a pure functional way, that would be the expectation. And then immutability is the idea that for the life of a given computation, the stuff I'm working with isn't going to change from underneath me. So I don't have to worry about some other process changing some property on an object while I'm processing a collection of objects. Um, and that is real. Um, and it's really lousy when that happens unexpectedly. Um, and this concept really isn't new. Um, uh, I first came across like, what that really meant when I was looking at Clojure and realized that Oracle actually, that's one of the distinguishing factors that I didn't appreciate about Oracle databases. And there's a lot not to appreciate about Oracle as a company, probably, but, um, but they have this concept of multi-version concurrency control. So you grab a query, you grab that result set, for the life of that handle that you have on that result set, the values are not gonna change from underneath you. 
Um, that's a really powerful concept, I think. Um, and especially when you're working with large data sets and you have complicated processing, um, that's to me is the root of some really hard bugs sometimes, uh, is, is trying to work through some of that. So going back in time, OJUG 2010. Um, uh, my wife Stephanie is here. Our 12 year old did a talk at the OJUG, did a 10 minute lightning talk on scheme or racket. And, um, and I really appreciated the OJUG letting him do that. Um, so he was talking about fractions and trying to check homework. And so think about this seriously right now for yourself. So if you wanted to write code that would take these fractions, process them, and then spit out the correct answers so that your grade schooler could check their homework, well, like, how would you write that code in whatever preferred language you're in? Right? And you're thinking about, you know, well, let's see, I'm going to put stuff, I don't know, into some kind of collection maybe and loop over that. And, you know, I mean, it's maybe not immediately obvious. Probably not going to be one line of code. Um, so he demoed how he did this. And it's kind of nice because Racket shows fractions as fractions. So here's one line of code using higher order functions from a sixth grader. Um, so we're going to map the plus operator over these two lists. And it's going to uh, add the first fraction of the first list and the first act fraction of the second list and then give you that answer in a list of answers. So in one line of code, I've got a function called map that's taking as an argument another function plus, and I've got two lists of numbers, and it's going to do that all in one line of code. That's higher order functions. There's a lot in this, right? This is very concise. Um, it's, um, there's no classes. Uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's very powerful, but it's, but it's not hard. It's hard if you haven't seen it before, but it, you know, kind of calling us out in general, like if a sixth grader can do it, we should be able to do it, right? <laughs> and uh, so um, that's, I think that's pretty interesting. So, Pure functions, a quick example. So let's say I want to run a query and total salaries and come up with an average. So this would be typical Java type code, except that I didn't put semicolons everywhere, but you'll get the idea. Um, so you know, you're going initi to initialize a variable of the total salaries to zero a counter. You'll loop over. So here's um, running, a, oops, um, running a query and getting the result set, you loop over the result set. Of course, I got the try catch. I didn't include the catch, but that's fine. Um, and I'm going to increment the counter. I'm going to incrementally add the salaries together, and then I can divide them at the end. No big deal. We've seen this code all the time. Um, this is not a pure function. I'm in the middle of a loop, and I'm uh, updating values outside the loop. So what this code definitely is not thread safe. Like if I wanted to do this in some kind of parallelized fashion, I would have to put semaphores around the totals and the counters because if I had multiple threads trying to read that same collection of data, I would probably be stepping on those values. So what's a pure function look like? The approach is going to look something like this. I'm going to define a function that just takes a collection and I'm going to collect the salary amounts off those employees and then I'll just issue a sum command and divide it by the size of that. And so I'll separately fetch that data um, and this last line is going to fetch that data from a database and the dot rows is going to convert it into a list of maps. So it's going to do a set transformation on that result set all in one shot. So by the time I have this function that's going to calculate the average salary, I'm completely disconnected from the external environment. I've just got a list of values. In this case, a list of maps. Actually, and this is kind of an interesting thought, um, if you want to go chase down some interesting object-oriented reading, look up some Alan Kay videos. Um, this is really what was meant by OO, which is I can have a list of objects, and as long as it responds to the property salary, um, or the message salary in, in small talk terms, um, you know, that was the whole intent behind Alan Kay's version of object-oriented programming in small talk, which looks nothing like C++ or Java. It was really all message passing, essentially. Here's a message to an object. I'm going to get something back. Um, but this is more of a functional style um, in Groovy. Final term is this idea of 4GLs. Um, so Technopedia calls this 
it was a group of languages that are trying to get closer to what we, how we think as humans in terms of expressing our intent, trying to solve problems. The promise of four GLs in the late 80s and 90s was to try to reduce the time and effort and cost to do software. So examples of these are things like DBase, Fox Pro, Power Builder, Progress, SQL. Scripting languages like Rex. I've seen some people throw in like Perl, PHP, Ruby, Python, maybe sort of. I don't, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna get into that debate. Um, but the idea is that it's some higher level. I'm not down in the weeds. So I'm, I, it's, the idea is it's more expressive. It probably has connect, like connections to external stuff. When you think about DBase, Power Builder, even like AS400, it's like it knows about the database, it knows about the screens, it knows about the printers. Like all that stuff is just kind of wired into the language. Um, and why 4GL? Because 1GL was zeros and ones, 2GL was assembler, and then 3GL was C, C++, Java, JavaScript, and kind of everything else. So what's interesting about these is, um, in my experience, very early in my career, um, I used something called Clarion and then rewrote it in Foxbase, like in a couple months, a point of sale system for a retail computer store. Um, I mean, and looking back on it, it kind of hit me literally today, like I actually built a lot of functionality as one developer in a really short amount of time. It wasn't web enabled, there's no web services, no app server, no event bus, you know, it was a database and some screens and, a, and some reports, but the store ran on it. Um, I had ran into the owner like 14 years after I had left the system was still running. They had to find one person to make one change for Y2K. I mean, it's kind of scary it was still running DOS. But you know what? But like, it wasn't connected to anything except its internal network. And I don't know. Anyway, did something kind of similar when I worked at United Healthcare. Um, did a couple things that were kind of in these higher level languages. And it, looking, again, looking back on it, it's like in a couple months, I was delivering a lot of functionality. And it was all business related. And there wasn't a lot of ceremony to this. And there weren't build systems, and I didn't have automated tests, and I would never give those up today. But what's interesting is that those systems were simple to build, they were, didn't cost much, and they were stable for years. There's kind of something to be said for that. I'm not saying I want to go work on an AS400 tomorrow, but like, as, again, like, so the architect in me, you know, the, the senior engineer in me looks at this experience, and I kind of reflect on that and go, you know, like, we have the web, we don't have these kinds of stories, really. Um, and of course, fast forwarding today, well, I mean, compared to 25 years ago, right? We're building better, faster, cheaper, on time, on budget, more stable. We're not doing any of that, really, are we? Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it kind of hit me. I was in a meeting one time where a VP said, you know, by this time next year, we want 50% of our engineers to be full stack. And it was a good goal because it was recognizing this idea that, you know, I should have somebody who could take a piece of functionality and go from top to bottom and own that. The hard part is full stack is Java, uh, you know, front end, back end, and cloud. And almost all of the senior engineers that were meeting with this person kind of gave that feedback that it's, a lot to be good at all of this. I can do some of it, all of it, but I'm not great at all of it. Absolutely not. Um, but it's only three things. Like, <laughs> what's the big deal, right? Like, then you got like blogs like this, right? Well, <laughs> well, this is why it's a big deal. Because, well, front end, like I did some nice view stuff for about a year, or year and a half. I enjoyed it. Um, well, you know, if I'm going to do front-end work, I probably need to know, well, not just JavaScript, but TypeScript and Webpack or Gulp and Yarn and React or Vue or one of those. And I mean, you just go on and on, right? This is just for the front-end. This is just my tech stack, the libraries I'm supposed to be able to master and build and put together. But we've got it better in Java, right? <laughs> you know, well, and I should have put Java 19, which I have a, a slide for. But you've got your build systems and the ORMs and Hibernate and Spring and all that. And it's good stuff, right? Like if we're building this stuff, we kind of need it. I'm not saying that we don't need this if we're going to use these technologies. Um, but there's a ton of stuff. And then, of course, now we got cloud too, right? So now I'm expected, because we're shifting left, 
I've got to know all of this stuff as well, and know it well, and not screw it up. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's a lot, right? So, I mean, no one really knows all of it. Like, we tend to be better at some parts of this than others. We might dabble in some of it. But it's weird in kind of some weird way. We kind of wear mastering this complexity kind of like a badge of honor. When I say we, I mean, I mean me. I mean, like, um, but sadly, this is like accidental complexity. Because I haven't even touched the domain yet. All of this is technology. It has nothing to do with processing healthcare claims um, or, or processing credit card transactions, you know, running railroads. I mean, you name it. Like, this isn't, I'm not even in the hard part yet, really, which is, which is the domain. There's just too much stuff. And I felt this for a while, but I haven't, I, I don't know, what, what can you do? You know, I mean, I feel like, where technologists were kind of dealt a certain hand, so to speak, at least in the companies that I've been a part of, and you know, you try to manage it as best you can. But I kept thinking, you know, there just there just has to be a better way. And I kind of started having flashbacks to, um, uh, you know, those earliest days of like, wow, you know, I remember using Rex. Rex was such a simple language. And I could pull stuff out of SAS and put it into DB2, and I could validate and transform the data. It was easy, it wasn't hard. I didn't have to learn a bunch of libraries. I could focus on like, literally, what is the data and how do I want to transform the data? That was the problem. Um, and so, um, you know, honestly, I mean, I keep thinking about this, like really, so Java, JavaScript are 25 years old. Like, we don't have anything better in 25 years. I mean, honestly, as engineers, Really? Like, there's innovation. We, you know, what's, we're, we're not, we shouldn't be using 25-year-old stuff. Um, but if we have that, and, and we shouldn't rewrite stuff every three years. And it shouldn't, oh, this happened for me for real on a project uh, when I was at Object Partners with a client. I was working with an engineer at the client. He made one change in an in a OO system, and it was in small talk. It took three weeks to track down the bug. Um, you know, like, we, we should be able to do better than that. But, but if you've ever worked in a massive OO system, and you know it's like, uh, there's all this state, and if somebody changes the state and something over here, and you're processing over here, and you have no idea, and none of this stuff is thread safe, you know, it, you can crash the system, and yeah, take three weeks on a system that's got a hundred million, I mean, not a hundred, it's got a million lines of source code, yeah, it, it probably did take that long. Um, and of course, I feel like, now, with the environment I was just talking about, I'm almost back to like the old J2EE days where I need at least a week to set up a development environment so a team can function if I want to build locally. Um, like, is this 2002 or 2022? Um, you know, and, and we do, this is just kind of like self-deprecating a little bit, but right, like, but we, we're kind of proud, like, well, but I'm doing JavaScript now, and at least I'm not using that old junky stuff, right? But um, yeah, well, or I'm in Java, thank goodness I'm not in JavaScript, right? I got some real OO in hand, you know, and, you know, this doesn't take very long to happen. This is only funny when it's not happening to you, right? But this is, this is, this is kind of what happens. Um, and I, in, in my experience, this is the nature of the beast. You try to do as good a job as you can with, and you start out with the left, but by the time you get into production, you, it, before you're even in production, you're already kind of in a little bit of a mess. Um, and then, of course, you know, I've, I've heard, you know, some people think, like, serverless Lambda is, is an architecture, an application architecture. It's not. It's a tool. But, you know, and if, but if we were only on AWS, it would fix all of our problems, right? I love this one of, yeah, well, here's Hello World on the cloud in AWS. It's a good thing we don't have any accidental complexity there. Um, and, of course, but it's a, the best part of it is, we're picking the hardest way to build something, and we get to pay the, for the privilege of it as well. So um, I thought the guy who created Rails had a, he had a great blog post that was shared with me recently. That's actually a few years old. And he talked about most developers do nothing at web scale. So if you're working at a company that's not, like, you're not really, like, you know, I'm not trying to be morbid, but like people don't die at web scale for insurance, right? I mean. It's, it's, it's not 
credit card transaction processing. It's not Facebook. You know, you're not, if you're not Facebook, you're not Google. Um, you know, you're not LinkedIn. You probably don't need the assembly language of cloud to deliver solutions. Um, and um, so I started thinking more about this, like, yeah, what's the impediment for being productive? You know, we, we have to deal with some essential complexity and we have to deal, well, we always have to deal with the essential complexity of a problem. So those are the domain things. Maybe it's even like, I've got to figure out how to be responsive. I've got to put data, you know, responsive with my user. I've got to put data in and out of a database so I don't lose the data. But accidental complexity are the frameworks, the languages. We start introducing mutability and side effects. We do a ton of autogen. Auto, uh, Rich Hickey, no relation, uh, author of Closure, has a great talk on just because you can autogen a bunch of code with a tool doesn't mean that you didn't introduce complexity into your system. Every line of code you generate adds complexity. Every dependent library adds complexity. We need to be a lot more thoughtful about that before we start introducing these things into systems that are going to live for a while. Um, so finally, I'm going to get to Live View. So, so Live View um, really was a game changer for me when I first uh, I was able to code uh, with it. I got to work with Abby Jones um, on it. and. She's continuing to, to do work um, in Elixir and Live View. So just finally, so some of the language. So we've got Beam, which is the virtual machine. So as you read about this stuff, it's kind of like the JVM, except it has a distributed cache. It sees its other, other machines that knows about it. You can distribute work across those VMs. It has PubSub built in, has thread safety. So when you kick off a function, that memory is local and you're not going to get into it. You can send messages to that process. It's got a very lightweight process model. And garbage collection happens on a pro per process, these really lightweight processes. So you're never going to have your virtual machine stop at a very inopportune time for an unacceptably long time to do a whole bunch of cleanup. Um, Elixir is the programming language I've been talking about. And you can kind of think, and peep, this will just make some people crawl, I'm sure, but, or skin crawl, but Erlang is kind of like Java the way Groovy is to Elixir in my mind, in the sense that Groovy really tried to um, kind of take the expressiveness of Java up a layer, and Elixir's in that same space. Erlang is, you know, you can do anything in Erlang just like you can do anything in Java, but for business, do we really need to do that for everything we do? Probably not. Phoenix is the web framework that's similar to, if you kind of squint, it kind of looks like Spring MVC, Rails or Grails, but it has stuff in it that those languages don't have, like channels for concurrent communication. Um, and there's, I, I'm not going to go into everything. So Live View is part of Phoenix, and it's like nothing I've seen. So in modern web development, we've got JavaScript with React View, Angular, sitting on. So we build all of this complicated UI code, frameworks. We've got routers. We've got state management. We've got all this stuff. And then we're going to send AJAX calls across the wire to something on a server, and we'll get back some kind of response. And this is really what, you know, in a, a very simplified view, but we've got a lot of code sitting on on the browser, right, in one language, and we've got who knows what sitting in on the server in another language or set of languages. So what is different about Live View is you end up with a very small JavaScript client on the browser. And all of the DOM uh, differences get computed server-side. Session gets state gets managed server side. Everything is happening over WebSockets server side. So when you render a live view, it's you know it's got HTML, CSS, and all that, and all the components. But as events happen, those events get fired off and processed um, on a Phoenix server, so running on the Beam VM, and it will handle that event. It'll recompute the changes that need to happen to the DOM. It'll update state, and it'll send just that update back. So if you're only updating one text field on a, on a form, that's all that's going to happen. You're going to fire one event over the web socket and you're going to get an update back. So what's different is, so this is kind of like going back in time to the JSP servlet days of I've got templates, I'm going to go fetch data, I'm going to merge it with those templates and I'm going to do a page refresh. The difference is um, 
is that, uh, let's see here, on, I'm gonna pull up an app that I built uh, for a client. So this is a, a calculator. Um, and it has, uh, it's for medical billing, uh, so think travel nursing kind of thing. So there's durations of the contract, they have specialties. Those specialties have uh, minimum hourly rates associated with them. They're also tied to the, to the state uh, that the position's gonna be in. There's government approved per diems that can be taken and uh, potential candidates can get paid pre-tax for the reimbursement on that stuff. This gets complicated. This whole form is like kind of like a whack-a-mole. Um, but what's interesting is, I, so I can go change that. That'll change the hourly pay, which rips through some of this um, payroll tax stuff, gross profit. You, you kind of get the idea, right? So as, as you're changing any of these, oops, uh, if I can use a browser here, um, you know, you're gonna see stuff rip through um, you know, you'll, you'll just see values change uh, by you know, go up here and change some stuff. So what's interesting is when, when we bid this project, it's like, oh yeah, we'll just do this in React, right? Or, or view, because it's just gonna be all in the browser. So this is all running live right now against a server. Every one of these things is firing an event. The event's being processed on the back end Phoenix server, recomputing in the, the computations, there's actually probably 15 at least functions that have to get recomputed every time you change a value. So every time I leave, I exit one of these fields, I'm hit, hitting all 15 of those computations, computing the differences, and it's getting sent back over the wire. And the code's super simple. It's, so it's, it's SPA-like performance without all of the complexity of those frameworks that um, I certainly was proud that I had kind of mastered view. Um, and then, then I felt sheepish. <laughs> because I didn't really need to. Uh, so, let's see here. Get back to the slideshow here. So the code, I'm not gonna do a, I am not gonna do an Elixir tutorial. We don't have enough time to do that. But this is different, right? This is like way different than what we've done in the past, or what we're doing today. The model is, is completely different. And it's great because everything's server side. State management, the routing, the event handling, um, template rendering, DOM diffs, API calls. I'm doing it all in one language on one side. And by the way, I don't have to have an API for every single event that happens on, on the UI. Because um, it's just a local function call. It's, it's awesome. Um, so, so the templates look like templates we've been writing for a long time, right? I've got a select for like the insurance drop down. So I'm gonna loop over the insurance plans that are offered. I'll create an option for those. The difference is in here, I've got this Phoenix, uh, Phoenix change code up in the upper right. Um, so that's gonna fire an event that the um, event handler is gonna process. And what's cool is this isn't like some special event handler. This is like just built into, it's like part of what you get with the beam. There's, it's, it's just message passing, um, which is, how the whole thing works, which is really clean. It's really nice. Um, so I've, I've fetched data from a database, and it's in a collection sitting in session for this user that connected to this job. Um, I populate those insurance plans from the database using that code, and it was just one line of code basically to fetch that data from the database after you set up the, you know, the structure that represents that database table. Handle event, I just have a simple event name. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of this code, um, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm handling that an event changed. I'm gonna update the state. I'm gonna change the plan. And because I changed that um, in this rate calculator struct, which represents the computations that are being done, I'm just gonna, I just rerun the calculations. And then that, I update the WebSocket session. And when this happens, this last line happens, then that DOM def gets computed and a small message gets sent back over that JavaScript socket. So it's, it's, the code's really clean for what it's doing. I'm, I'm processing an event, I'm gonna update the state of the rate calc. I'm not worried about the state of the UI. Phoenix is handling that for me. Um, <laughs> so I, I know this isn't a super complicated app, but what was great is um, I was able to do the deploy um, 
like, I'd never used GigaLixer before, which is, as a hosting provider, you can pick GCP um, or AWS to deploy onto. Um, <laughs> I literally did a git push into GigaLixer and it deployed the app. No certifications required. And it's, just, it's a web app with a database. Um, I mean, it's, it's really nice. Um, and let me go back over here real quick. So looking at my local dashboard, so it comes with a, Phoenix ships with this dashboard um, that's live. So my app is taking all of 65 megabytes. Um, like, I don't know. I haven't done a spring deploy lately, but I'm pretty sure it still takes like 400 meg to get a minimal, um, you know, Java app up and running. Um, and this is, uh, this is what's kind of neat. I mean, it's it's like really efficient. It's really fast. The app starts up in no time. Um, there's, uh, it's it's um, it's really clean. It's really exciting. Um, it's easy. This is the part I like. It's easy. Everything I've tried to do in functional programming over the last probably ten years, build something, just a hobby app, has never been easy. Um, but but this is, and and this is a game changer. And then getting getting that single page app performance without writing any view code, um, it's awesome, it's great. My code just looks like algorithm code. It's taking me back to those 4GL days. Um, so um, there's a lot in here. How did I, so here's how I got here in a, in a little bit more detail. Yeah, I really did take all my Java books to the goodwill. Um, uh, you know, there's like learn seven languages in seven days. There's a great uh, blog post out there about um, learn a new language in 10,000 hours. This quote is kind of that point. Like if all I'm doing is changing syntax, I'm not, there's probably not a whole lot there. This is really a different way of thinking about things. It's different in two ways. Functional programming is different if, you're never, if you've never done it. It's a, it's a different type, it's a different mindset. And then also Erlang has things that you just don't have in other runtimes. This massive, uh, lightweight threading model, uh, process model, is completely different. You fire up little servers all over the place for everything, and it's super easy. And message passing is just built in. The pub sub's just there. Um, and it's distributed across machines or VMs. Um, so I got to kind of, why did I make a jump? Why did I, you know, in May say, you know what, I want to do this full time. I don't want to do the Java stuff anymore. I kind of got tired of, I love functional programming, but it was always bolted on. So Groovy was great, and it works pretty well as long as everybody follows conventions. But there's nothing enforcing the conventions. That's the problem. You can build apps with immutability, and you'll get, it will change how your app, um, how, how stable it is, um, how your projects, these big projects, when I've done them in Groovy, and we take a kind of a pure function approach, they go really well, actually. But you're trusting that the developers are going to do things a certain way. There's nothing in the JVM that's going to force this. Um, and like, oops, I, closure I really wanted to love, but I just couldn't, I, every time I, I, I always just ran into Roblox, so the libraries just weren't quite there. I looked at Kotlin, it looks great coming from Java. For me personally, coming from Groovy, I just didn't like it. It just felt, it didn't feel as concise, it didn't feel as, uh, you know, oh, I got something cool I want to get done quick. I'm going to just do it in, in Kotlin like I could do it in Groovy. It just felt more work. I tried really hard to like Scala. I felt like it was a mess, and I'm not going to go into why. Um, but, I mean, I did, a, I did an all-day class at Nebraska Code it, with an expert in it, and I was actually convinced, it convinced me not to take a job at a company <laughs> um, that I was really excited to go to because I did not want to build my career in that. Um, so I was really, really ready to move on from having the stuff I love about functional programming be, being bolted onto something else, and it's bolted onto JavaScript too, to a certain extent. Um, and I'm kind of tired of the over-engineered stuff. It's like we keep, you know, between the frameworks and the libraries and the cloud architectures, it's just like I started hitting this point. So this is where I'm at personally. You know, living through this, I don't want to live through this stuff again. And large-scale OO really does feel like a Rube Goldberg machine. You start something running, you set up all your objects, you hit the magic method, and you hope everything happens correctly. And if somebody doesn't put the little cup in the right place or the flag on the 
green pinwheel isn't set just quite right, the whole thing blows up. This isn't fun. I don't enjoy this. Like, this isn't, I, can I figure out when systems go wrong? Yeah, I've got a lot of experience doing it, but I don't enjoy it. It's not, it's, it's not fun. I'm ready to move on from that. So for me, what I figured out is the, the functional programming big wins for me are, I really enjoy it. I enjoy doing it in Elixir, not having it bolted on. The smaller functions, the, less, the lower cognitive load, I'm not writing mocks. You can do mocking, but you don't need to. I'm not worrying about state. Everything's just easier to manage. Um, and my experience has been when I took that functional approach, it really does make a difference bringing those projects home, the big ones. Um, Sometimes projects can squirrel sideways, and, and I know that there's some people in this room that have seen this where you have like a, what's probably a two-year project, and one year into it, things weren't modeled right, you made some fundamental mistakes, you knew more a year into it than you did before, and it's really hard to re-engineer all that code. When I've taken a functional approach to things, um, I didn't have those problems. I might have just got lucky. I'm, I'm fully you know, willing to admit that. Um, but. I feel like I've seen where things could go sideways and they didn't. Um, and um, I've worked for at least two companies that have had, have said, we don't like to do a lot of deployments because they take anywhere from three months to nine months after the deployment to resolve all the bugs from that deployment. I'm not making this up. I've never had that problem on any project where I've taken a functional approach. Um, so one of the things that I like about um, the functional programming also, and this is, just, this is just a quote that I read a long time ago and it caught my attention, I won't dive into it. But this idea of, I'd rather have 100 functions that operate on one data structure than 10 functions on 10 data structures, which is really like the functional versus OO. What's interesting is once you start building that mental mindset of how functional languages work, the approach works everywhere. And it actually becomes simpler. You just kind of know what to expect. Um, and, um, yeah, and then, you know, when you get into the Erlang thing with concurrency and immutability, you, you, you eliminate a whole class of problems. So this I just saw on Twitter, and I'm not a teenage Min Newton, Newton Ninja fan, but I kind of get it, I think. So Java 1995, um, you got these little kids along, and then somewhere in 2003 to 11, you had these languages, and then Java was kind of on the coattails of those. And Java 19 is finally here. So we finally have the Java we've always wanted to love. And um, somebody was posting, there's like five things that are just awesome about Java 19. One of them is structured concurrency. Let's you treat multiple tasks on different threads as an atomic operation, making multi-threaded programming easier. Wow. Like, so Erlang had that like 30 years ago. Um, Pattern matching. I'm not going to get into what it is, but if you've looked at it at all, it's like a, it's a completely different way to think about um, how you're managing flow control. Um, that's been in Erlang since day one. It's just part of Elixir, and it's been there, and it's and it's a core part. It's not bolted onto the language in some weird way. Um, it's just always been there. Um, and the whole idea of uh, virtual threads and high throughput concurrent applications, like it's just already been there. Um, so I'm glad that Java's getting there, but it feels like whenever I look at this stuff in Java, it never feels as clean as it does in Erlang. And Erlang's way harder to read than Elixir. And in Elixir, it's just, it's just easy. For me, it just feels easy. Um, and um, you know, this is just more about the complexity. So what's nice about, so think about this, the app that I, I, I um, deployed was just one Erlang VM. And I've got a distributed cache, I've got PubSub, I've got all this stuff. I've got a one app server and a database, and that's it. I got two boxes. It's great, it's nice, it's clean, it's so clean. Um, it, it's just so much easier. Um, and yeah, the, the Beam VM, it's, it is kind of like a cloud in a box. So you can scale to a million processes. It's got that built-in hypervisor. So if your processes crash, they'll restart. It's really cool. Um, the the pub sub, the um, per thread garbage collection is really nice, and the and the um, or threads or processes are isolated, so you can't step on each other, and that and that's what makes it. Um, I think that's what gives you your unparalleled uptime. In the cloud, what you're going to do, you'll still be in the cloud, but you're going to scale vertically first. So you're going to want a machine, and you want to max out that machine so you can let Erlang does what it does best. 
Let it manage all of those processes for you. It will do a better job of it than letting AWS manage thousands of lambdas or whatever. And what's cool, think about this from a development perspective. It's all on my machine. I just, how do I want to test this cloud native app? I just do, instead of Ant or Maven, I do Mix. Mix Phoenix server. It starts the server. It's all there. And my database. I gotta have a, my post request database. That's it. Like, I didn't pay somebody, literally months, one of my best engineers, to figure out how to get the development environment working so I can simulate all of the AWS stuff locally so that I have an idea of what will happen when I go into the real AWS environment. So I'm gonna end with, so how am I doing here? This is, I'm better than I expected. Um, so I've blown through a lot of stuff, but if we, if, if, just kind of stepping back a little bit and thinking about this, so some, I was talking about this earlier, I know there are companies where you have culture issues with you got the front end people, the back end people, the infrastructure teams, they don't all play along together that nice. A lot of times they like to blame each other for stuff. Um, honestly, sometimes they look down on it. Like those JavaScript people don't really get it or those Java people, they're stuck back. You know, they don't understand that JavaScript's the new COBOL. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's more similar than it's different. Elixir and Erlang are fundamentally different. That the runtime models are different. It's not just syntax. And um, yeah, so, you can, so I think there's an opportunity here to like, when I talked about that quote of we want to have 50% of our engineers be full stack, like I think that's a good goal. What if we could actually achieve it? What if we changed our platform? So then I've got everybody kind of on the same page. And I'm not doing any more of my codes ready, but I'm just waiting for them. And I've seen this before, whether they're waiting on CDKs to be built for AWS, or they're waiting for the back-end services to be built, or the front-end to be built. And of course, we've got all these multi-repos because, you know, you change one thing and we're actually deploying 10 or 20. Wouldn't it be better just to say I don't need one, rather than to have mastered the skills around multi-repos? Um, Instead of hundreds of dependencies, wouldn't it just be better to have 10? Like those, those slides I had that had all those things that like, on any one of those slides, I am sure every person in this room knew every single term I had on at least one of them, and probably half of them on the other. Wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to know all of that stuff? Um, and of course, you know, setting up a, your laptop to run some of this stuff today is just, it's just painful. Um, so for me personally, it's like I want to put that badge of honor for mastering that accidental complexity. Just put it on a shelf. I don't ever want to look at it again. I want to be more productive. I want to code in something that gives me joy. I want to be productive. And I know it's hard, like seriously, change my framework. I mean, whether you're a Ruby person or Spring or React, it's like, um, like we're invested in this stuff, right? But I think sometimes it's good for us to remember, well, we were using something else when we found this one. So it's not like we can't change if we want to, um, or certainly, and certainly I can. So if you want to get started in this, kind of building, at least from my perspective, you can start using functional programming techniques probably in your primary language already. Like there, the stuff is in there in Java, it's in there in JavaScript um, or TypeScript. Um, and I would, I would challenge you to do three things. See, next time you write a function or a method, see if you can write that code without instance variables. This is a, it's a great thought experiment. You're never gonna declare something like x equals zero or have a temporary variable inside of a function. Write a new function, uh, that, write a function that doesn't require that. So that's gonna, you're probably gonna have to dig into the libraries, you're gonna have to look at some of the, maybe the parts of a language that you haven't done before. Start thinking in terms of set transformations. So that little bit of code I had before where you're gonna iterate over something in a result set. Instead think about, I'm gonna fetch all of the employees and their salary, actually I'm gonna fetch all the employees, now I'm gonna transform that set of employee information into a set of salaries. Now I'm gonna transform, I'm gonna reduce that set of salaries to one number and then of course I'll uh, divide that by the count and get my final number. But it's start thinking in terms of set transformations. We've got so much RAM on these machines. Most of what we do, this is just my experience, even at, a, at Fortune 500 companies, 
if you're thoughtful about the data that you actually need, you can do it all in RAM. You don't have to be worried about, am I fetching too much data at once? You can fetch it all at once, transform it, and get rid of it. And it, your tests will change. There's all kinds of things that will happen if you try this, this kind of experiment. And then try to eliminate mutation by convention in your existing languages. In other words, so you're going to pass data in, you're going to return something back out, and you're not going to change the thing you passed in. That it's, it's an interesting thing to try to do. So what you might find yourself doing is you have, say, a, a collection of employees. You might have a list or a map that has a, a pointer to the employee, and you have some extra data. But you're not mutating that collection that you originally got back. What's nice about that is as that collection gets passed around, and your fellow programmer who's doing something else with that same collection doesn't have to wonder, you know, did this person change it before I got it? And how did they change it before I got it? You know that in whatever state that maybe was originally fetched, you kept that thing intact. Um, I think if you do this, you'll be surprised how your existing code and your existing languages will be better. And I also guarantee you'll be frustrated with your language and your compiler and your runtime at some point, because you want it to do more, and it doesn't. And, um, so kind of a hands-on path, I think, depending on where you're at as a developer. If you've never done anything with a functional programming language, uh, The Little Schemer is a great book. It's just a great book, period. Like all of us as professionals should experience that book at some point. It's, it's, it's a wonderful way to get used to functions and recursion. If, you've, if you're comfortable with that, um, there's three places you can kind of start. You, uh, there's a programming, uh, pragmatic programmer's book uh, called Programming Elixir, that's good. I like Elixir for Programmers, this video course, I think it was 25 or $35. It was great. It's not comprehensive, but it absolutely takes you through just enough to know and see how things are different. Like, not just syntax, but like you start creating servers, many servers for things that you would never, you just would never take that approach. So it, it helps kind of jumpstart you into really that different mindset, like really thinking about how you engineer things differently. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that video course. Um, there's also um, a book in beta called Programming Phoenix Live View that's very current, and it's, it's, I think it's really good. Um, what's amazing right now is um, there's this thing that I've never heard of until a couple weeks ago called Humble Bumble. Um, and you can donate, like, I don't know what it is, up to eight, you know, $18, at least $18, but maybe more. And you get all 19 Elixir-related books from the Pragmatic Programmer Press. This is great. This has got really good stuff. And it has things like, so I have not used this, but it has a, so if you're brand new to functional programming, like maybe instead of doing the little schemer, although I really, it's hard for me not to, to say you shouldn't experience that. But there's a learn functional programming with Elixir. So really designed for beginners. That, that, that would probably be a, a great place to start, maybe even before you do the, the programming Elixir book. But somewhere you kind of want to, you want to pick something that's not Java. I would not start with Venkat's functional programming in Java book. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that book, but get out of the runtime you're used to, whether it's Java or JavaScript get into something else. It's going to be different. You're going to, you're going to experience it in ways that um, you wouldn't otherwise. Um, and that's what I wanted to get through. Um, a lot of stuff in there. Any, there's, there's got to be questions. <laughs> yeah. Or just shock. <laughs> <laughs> It's just HT, plain HTML and JavaScript. There's no computations being done at all in the browser. It's all on the back end. But the, the styling is... Yeah, so there's, there's CSS styling. Okay. So there's, it's HTML and CSS. Okay. Got it. 
Um, and an interesting thing about that is um, because it's just plain old HTML and CSS, um, uh, one of the success uh, stories, I guess, is that um, people felt like they were getting, um, like cars.com, they redid their whole system uh, in Elixir and Phoenix um, and went live about a year ago. And they got like, they felt like they got SEO for free because, because on the first load of, of Live View, you're getting all of the, the content that'll help with the search engine stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, there's no, no JavaScript and it's just, yeah, it's just that template, template like code, right? Um, you know, HTML with something that gets blended in. It's still browser side rendering. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the browser has to, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's no, like, the yeah, the browser has to interpret the HTML. The difference is that as that DOM changes on the browser, what's changing and how that's being changed is being handled by that little bit of JavaScript. So on the, on the server side, it's saying, oh, I need to change uh, these, I changed one value here, um, these eight other computed values changed. So then it's gonna send something back. It's a, literally a data structure and you can inspect it. It's not hard to read. It'll, there'll be an ID for each part of the DOM that has to be updated with the new value. And then so it's just that little bit that comes back and then the JavaScript updates the DOM on the browser side. Um, yeah, um, I know what you're talking about. Time travel. Time yeah, travel. <laughs> um, that's interesting. I don't know, Abby. Have you ran into that at all, or? Yeah.
Well, yeah, and what's interesting about, well, it's, this is different, I guess, but um, the, yeah, so if you lose that connection or something crashes, um, there is code on the browser JavaScript little client that uh, when the process restarts, it'll try to, to reestablish the state that it was in uh, before it crashed. Um, which most of the time is going to be exactly what you want, and you just get that for free. Um, it was interesting watching the talk about cars.com because they didn't fully appreciate that at the scale that they were doing stuff at. So when they went live for real, like their users might have 10 tabs open. And, um, and they might have several hundred thousand people online and one of the things that, and this is, this is very interesting, so the, the app worked, people were getting responses, but there was actually a bug, and it was crashing behind the scenes. Oh. So then it, was, then it would try to restart, and then it would restart, so you, would keep, you kept getting um, all of this communication that was happening, that they weren't, so they actually needed, to, you can turn that off with just one line of code. So they had like, this is kind of an interesting story too, so you know, there's, so it's different. This model's different. Like you, you got Erlang that's different. You've got Phoenix that's different with the whole socket thing. Because you can do that socket thing. There's a React library, I think, that, that lets you try to do something similar. Um, but it's like a different way of thinking about um, web apps. But what was interesting is, so they had like some, some huge problems. Like they had like 25 million log error messages hit like in one hour when they first went live. But the system didn't go down. Um, and they changed one line of code, redeployed, and, um, and addressed it. And so they were like, it was, they had the, what to me felt like um, just horrific errors um, on that first deploy. But within a few hours, they had resolved all the issues and the system stayed up. And, I, and it's very unnerving, I thought. Like the, I, so the first time that um, I had a bug, so I was tabbing into one of the fields and it was crashing my computation, like, and that, you know, that would not be good in a JVM to, to have that, the error that I was getting or creating at that time. But it was weird because, like you said, the hypervisor just restarts the process, the page is up and working, and as long as I never tabbed into the, uh, or exited, yeah, tabbed in and tabbed out of the field that had the one bug, the app was up and running, and I didn't even know it. I was like confused, like, what's going on here? And then I looked at my output log and I realized, oh, I'm, I'm crashing my process. But, but if I had never looked at it, I wouldn't know. Um, so things like that are, it, yeah, they're, I don't know, they're game changers, kind of, I think. Um, when you experience them, you know. Uh, and there's, it, there, are, there's, there are lots, I mean, that's what's good about, and maybe this is what, um, you know, Kevin and I were talking about, like, something new, something fresh. Um, you know, what's exciting about this is it's just a different way of thinking about problems. The errors you get are different. The problems you're solving are different. Um, but it's not just new. It, like, just feels better. And that's, like, a very personal thing, right? I can't, like, I can't convince people that, that you would have the same experience. But yet, given my history, where I've come from, the different things I've looked at, it just all, like, just feels right. It, they, they got something, they got something right. And... And the runtime is fundamentally different. I mean, it really is, and in a good way, in a in a in a good way. Uh, no thread local. No. Um, I mean, just yeah. I think about all the knowledge that I've accumulated over time that kind of feels like, you know, it, it was just understanding the technology that we were running on, but it wasn't really solving business problems. Um, and they're not even necessarily all that interesting, like diving into how Java does threading. I don't know, maybe. I mean, when you're trying to solve it, I guess it feels good to solve the problem, but looking back on it, like, is, did that knowledge like, make me better in some way? I don't know. I, like, I don't feel great about it. I'm not, like, I'm not ashamed of it, but I'm not like, I, I would have rather spent time doing something else, more, I don't know, more something <laughs> innovative, I don't know. Um, and you can do JavaScript components. I don't know if you've done any of that, Abby, yet, but I know you can put like some React or, yeah. you, you, I mean, you've got all kinds, there are hooks into JavaScript components if you truly want to do something. 
uh, browser based outside. So, and that's what feels good too. I knew this was, uh, this is kind of a good, and I, I'll, I'll, I can wrap it up a after this thought, but um, one thing I like about it, it's definitely a web framework, but it feels closer to a toolkit almost than a heavyweight framework. And what I mean by that is, so I, when I remember when I first met the person who created Gradle, the Gradle build system, and he was talking about the difference between it and Maven, and he said he didn't want to build this rigid framework where you have to figure out where you plug your exact thing into, and um, if you deviate from that at all, you will experience great pain. And, and most people that, even if you like Maven, know what that looks like. Um, where Gradle, it was more like, we built this frame, our toolkit, the toolkit understands builds. Um, you can make it do whatever builds you want. So, it, uh, so you're getting some of that domain knowledge or, that, or the, the, the utility, but you're not locked in. And some of this feels like it's just building on like what's already underneath. Like they didn't have to build a, a special messaging system, it's just there. And, and uh, the distributed stuff is just there. It's like, it's just, it feels so much more lightweight and less, like you can kind of do whatever you want. With it, there's definitely a good way to do it. And, and, and I'm not saying there isn't a framework there, there is. But um, to me, it feels different. It, it, it feels like that difference between going from Ant or Maven to, to Gradle where you've just got a little bit more freedom to do what you want. They've got all the right hooks in just the right place. And you don't feel, you don't feel like you're going to have somebody come in, like the uh, Monty Python hammer is not going to come down from the clouds and pound you on you for, for doing something. Um, it just feels like it was it meant to be extended. Um, and I never felt that way, um, with, um, certainly with Maven and, and, and some other frameworks, you know, feel more uh, like you just have to kind of toe the line, like it's their way or the highway. So anyway. Well, thank you. I appreciate being able to um, do this. Um.